There I am. Okay. So hi, I'm Leslie Rubel, and I'm helping out today. I was thrilled to hear Marsha, our speaker, on the radio the other day, which was terrific. It got me in the mood. And I think you guys are using chat already, so I don't have to bring that to your attention. We talked about closed captioning. Please, it's a CC that's there on the Zoom screen. And we are recording, and we do put the recordings on the website. Michael's had a lot of questions. Michael Machette's had a lot of questions about where are the recordings? We put them on YouTube and then we post the YouTube link right on the speaker's posting on our website. So in Marsha's case, it will be right up on top of Marsha's post. We'll put the recording to YouTube. So you don't have to go any place particularly special. Um, I'm going to end the poll, Michaels. And you've been looking at the results, right, Michael? I haven't seen them. Okay, share results. Okay, there we go. And where are you living now? The majority of the people are locals around the Olympic Peninsula. A quarter of people are within Washington State outside of Olympic Peninsula. And 20% are out of the state. So that's interesting. We're starting to pick up more people that are regional or national. So that's great, our footprint's getting larger. As far as uh, what's your geology knowledge, uh, 37 or roughly a third of the audience has what we call a high level, probably a bachelor's or higher degree or they're practicing professionals. 12% uh, have medium skill sets in geology and half of the audience is, takes geology as a, either a hobby or an interest area or just as enthusiasm for these subjects so yay great to know yeah and how did you hear about our meeting today uh, 80 percent roughly from our e email or newsletter we have a big mailing list of 1200 people so we reach pretty widely with that uh seven percent local news that's the local newspapers a little bit of social media friends are talking about it and there's some other people are finding it written on bathroom walls and that sort of thing i guess others so I'm gonna go ahead and close that out and start my introduction here, if you don't mind. Okay. Thanks, Leslie, for setting up the Zoom broadcast for us. That's been a great help. And thank all of you out there for coming to our Quimper Geological Society lecture. Uh, it's a perfect day to be at your monitor here in Fort Townsend. It's rainy and 40 degrees, so sit back and enjoy today's event. Maybe get your special beverage out. Uh, this will run about an hour. Marsha is gonna have uh, 40 or 50 minutes of lecture, and then we'll entertain questions at the very end. Uh, about our upcoming schedule, you'll see it posted on the website pretty soon. Chris Goldfinger from Oregon State University will be our speaker, but he'll be broadcasting from our studios in Mexico. Yeah, there's a story there. Uh, this lecture will focus on the offshore turbidite record of larger earthquakes on the Cascadia subduction zone. It'll be a nice follow on to Carl Wegman's uh, story on turbidites in Lake Crescent we had back in November. So Goldfinger's lecture is on February 18th. That's a Saturday, of course, at 4 p.m. And then just a month later, we'll have David Williams, who's been a frequent speaker of ours. He's a nat uh, naturalist and writer, geology writer from Seattle. He's going to speak about the secrets of Seattle's geology, connections of the human story and the geologic story. This will be our first in-person lecture since COVID emerged three years ago. So we're very happy to go back to Port Townsend High School. It'll be a four o'clock Saturday lecture on March 18th. Hopefully if you're worried about COVID still, bring your mask and mask up. But the seating in the Port Townsend uh, High School Auditorium is about 250 to 300. So I'm hoping that we get a fair bit of our audience back for the in-person in lecture. So that's the upcoming news. Uh, today's speaker is Marsha. Bjorn Rood, Bjorn Rood, okay, butchering that up. She's a geologist and a science writer. writer. Uh, Marsha is a professor of geology and environmental studies at Lawrence University in Appleton, Wisconsin. She received a bachelor's in geophysics from the University of Minnesota, and she got her master's and PhD in structural geology from the University of Wisconsin in Madison. She stuck pretty close to home, it looks like. Marsha began her professional career at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio, where she worked with now uh, fairly famous Washington uber geologist Nick Zentner. However, she gave up her tenured position there 
to return to Wisconsin and join the faculty at Lawrence, where she has taught and guided research for 30 years. She teaches courses ranging from hard rock geology to planetary geology, environmental modeling, and the history of science. She has a very diverse background. Marcia is internationally inter recognized as a hard rock and structural geologist. She's a fellow of the Geological Society of America, and she was a Fulbright sc senior scholar twice, once in Norway and once in New Zealand. Marcia is a prolific writer. She's the author of a book called Reading the Rocks, the Autobiography of the Earth. I recommend that highly. And Timefulness, Thinking Like a Geologist, which you'll speak about today. When not studying Wisconsin's rocks, which are probably like 90% of the time, Marcia is an avid cross-country skier, bicyclist, berry picker, and mother of three sons. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Marcia Jorgerud from Wisconsin, speaking about truth timefulness today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael, and also Leslie and Shelley for logistical help here. Um, it's a thrill to join this group. So, and Marcia, this is Leslie. It says that you don't have your video on. That's why I can't see you. Okay, I think I do. Can other people see me? Nope. Nope. Hmm. Strange. Okay. Um, I thought you were just being mysterious. No, I can see myself on the screen. <laughs> <That's strange. laughs> and I, my, my camera is not, you know, it doesn't have the red line through it. I think you need to make her a um, presenter. Sorry? I think you need to make I can't hear whoever's talking. Mm -hmm. uh, I see that Michael is uh, showing as a speaker right now, even though Michael's not actually speaking. I don't know if that's a clue. Yeah. Okay, I, Marcia, you just came through, and I'm putting you up. Sorry, right. you just it you it just clicked on Zoom. There you are. Hi. Michael, say hi, and I'll disappear you. Bye. <laughs> Bye, everybody else. Marsha, welcome. Thank you. And as I was saying, I'm thrilled to be joining this group. Um, I'm frankly a bit envious that you have such a robust group of citizens who are interested in the geosciences, and it's a wonderful thing, and I'll be tuning in to future talks. So thank you so much for the invitation. Um, and I recognize some names out there from, I don't know that I've met some of you, but I certainly recognize fellow geologists in the list. But my talk is pitched to ordinary earthlings, all of us. And so I hope there'll there be something of interest for everyone today. So I'm gonna share my screen and, and get started. So I hope everyone can see that. So let me give you just a little bit of a abstract of what I wanna to say today. And it is, I guess, above all that practicing geology is more than anything, a profound act of imaginative power. And so I wanna talk a little bit about what it took to envision deep time. So take us through a little bit of a history of the discovery and calibration of, of geologic time. Although we've all spent far too much time on screens in the last two years, it's unlikely that you would find anyone, even the most obdurate flat earthers, who would insist that the world is in fact only two dimensional. Such a world was the premise of Edwin Abbott's classic, but offensively and unnecessarily misogynistic thought experiment of a novel, Flatland, published in 1884. The characters in the book are intellectually cramped by their incapacity to imagine three-dimensional objects or spaces. The narrator is one of only a few citizens to recognize through dreamlike visions and an encounter with a quasi-divine presence called the sphere, depicted here in the lower right, that Flatlanders in fact occupy only one plane within a much larger three-dimensional reality. Elites in the government are apparently aware of this, but actively suppress the dissemination of the idea of a third dimension. And the narrator is actually telling his story from a cell where he has been imprisoned for his dangerous knowledge. It's an interesting conceit and a potentially powerful political allegory, 
But unfortunately, Abbott makes his point through the intellectually cramped social hierarchy of his own time and place, depicting, for example, women as one dimensional characters, not even able to fully grasp the two dimensionality of men and boys. So I don't know if you can see in the, on the left side here, the, the title page shows um, a house of these flatlanders. The women enter through a narrow slot since they're only one dimensional lines, whereas the men and boys require a larger opening. Anyway, I remember reading this book in a high school math class and feeling incredulous that the teacher didn't mention how profoundly sexist it was. I don't know if other people have come across this. Anyway, I mentioned this flatland because despite its less than enlightened presuppositions, it is in some ways relevant to us. We too live in a culture that struggles to recognize an entire dimension that gives shape to our lives, namely, of course, time. In fact, we as a society may be even more obtuse than the ignorant flatlanders because although we have plenty of opportunities to glimpse time, we actively choose, indeed make strenuous efforts to deny its existence for a whole spectrum of reasons ranging from personal vanity and fear of death to religious orthodoxies and capitalist fantasies. Meanwhile, we geologists like the narrator of Flatland have for two centuries been patiently assembling evidence and trying to convince our fellow citizens that time is real, powerful, and very, very deep. Mapping deep time, building and calibrating the geologic time scale is among humanity's greatest but least appreciated intellectual achievements, perhaps because it was not the work of a solitary genius but rather a collective endeavor that has taken the better part of two centuries and is in fact still a work in progress. And I wanna acknowledge at the outset here that my comments focus on the evolution of geologic thinking in the West. I hope there will be more academic scholarship in the future on the evolution of geologic thinking in other parts of the world where the Bible did not shape and cramp thinking about the history of the natural world. But it is true that the geologic time scale as we know it began to take shape in Britain and Western Europe in the late 18th century. And my central thesis today, as I've already mentioned, is that charting deep time is not just a triumph of scientific reasoning, but in fact, a feat of extraordinary imagination, a conceptual leap akin to the challenge flatlanders faced in envisioning a third dimension. So let us follow the intellectual arc that took us from an earth that was thousands of years old to one that was perhaps infinitely old, who, to, to one that whose age was finally quantified as finite, but immensely great. And this graphic, I'll show you a few times, it's my attempt to show how the earth got old and then a little bit younger and then old again on a logarithmic scale in years on the left and then in actual calendar years across the, the horizontal axis. I'm reflexively skeptical when someone is referred to as the father of a discipline or idea, but I think the designation father of geology is legitimate for James Hutton, the Scotsman, um, part of the Edinburgh Enlightenment, who is usually credited with discovering deep time. Um, and Leslie, if, if that poll is available, we could launch that now. Um, sure. Many of you will be familiar with this lithograph, which is a schematic depiction of Hutton's unconformity at Sicker Point. So I just wanted to know how many people out there have made the pilgrimage at some point to Sicker Point. Um, for those who haven't, the, the, the great contribution that, that Hutton made um, was to recognize how to read this outcrop, again, very schematically depicted here, two sequences of rocks, one lower, therefore older sequence that was sedimentary, but beds were tilted on end, and then an upper sequence where the beds were more or less horizontal and in between sort of a rubbly layer. And his great epiphany was that the junction between these two um, sequences would represent the time it would take to essentially dismantle a mountain belt by erosion because he recognized that tilted rocks represented crustal upheaval. This is more than 150 years before plate tectonics was even a gleam in geologist's eye, but he, he recognized the imprint of crustal upheaval and the idea that to erode a mountain belt to a flat plain would have taken far, far, far longer than the 6,000 or so years allotted in literal biblical um, interpretations. So Hutton gave us deep time and it looks like a good more than 10% of us have, have 
been to this very, very famous outcrop Sicker Point. I don't think, however, that many geologists, even though they've heard of Hutton, are aware that his motivations and methods were not entirely in line with the standards of modern scientific inquiry. Most people who encounter Hutton's ideas today read them as they were transcribed by his good friend, John Playfair, who's up here in the right, another polymathic Scotsman in his 1802 volume, Illustrations of the Huttonian Theory of the Earth, published about 13 years after um, Hutton's death. And that is the work in which this famous lithograph first appeared. Playfair, a natural philosopher and geometrician, was from a, an accomplished family that included brothers James, a notable architect, and William, an early statistician who invented many of the graphical um, depictions of data that we use all the time in spreadsheets today, like pie charts and bar graphs. <laughs> so it was quite an amazing family. The conventional wisdom among geologists has long been that John Playfair liberated Hutton's brilliant thinking from Hutton's convoluted writing. But as someone who regularly pontificates to my, my students about how good writing and clear thinking go hand in glove, I've always found this suspect. Hutton's writing is certainly florid by 21st century standards, but not much more so than Playfair's. Indeed, I find many of Hutton's turns of phrase quite beautiful. The most famous sentence from his 1788 treatise, Theory of the Earth, is sheer poetry, which many of you will know. He writes, the result, therefore, of this physical inquiry is that we find no vestige of a beginning, no prospect of an end. And the opening words of Theory of the Earth are more inspiring than the first lines of most modern geology textbooks. Hutton wrote, when we trace the parts of which this terrestrial system is composed, and when we view the general construction of those several parts, the whole presents a machine of a peculiar construction where so many living creatures are to ply their respective powers. We are not to look for a nature in a quiescent state. Matter itself must be in motion, and the scenes of life a continued or repeated series of agitations and events. To me, this evokes a remarkably modern sense of the workings of a tectonically and biologically active planet and the truly radical idea that the boundaries between animal, vegetable, and mineral are fluid. Reading further, however, one begins to suspect that Playfair's real editorial interventions to ensure Hutton's legacy were not merely stylistic, but substantive, namely excising Hutton's frequent assertions that these natural marvels reveal divine wisdom. For example, after a rapturous paragraph on how wonderfully Earth's climate and soils are suited to support life, Hutton states, there is not, not any particular respecting either the qualities of the materials or the construction of the machine more obvious to our perception than are the presence and efficacy of design and intelligence in the power that conducts the work. This is awkward, the father of geology invoking God the Father. In fact, Hutton's was only several, one of several 18th century theories of the earth, most of them blatantly teleological and almost comically Panglossian. But among these, only Hutton's work survives, despite his embarrassing invocations of providence, because he was right about so many things. At a time when leading geologists from Europe asserted that all rocks had been deposited in water, Hutton grasped the essential concept of the rock cycle in which pre-existing rocks may be eroded and redeposited as sedimentary strata or contorted in mountain building to become metamorphic rocks or melted to form igneous bodies in an endless process of reincarnation. He had an impressionistic idea that the solid crust of the earth was periodically reworked and split asunder by great subterranean heat sources more than 150 years before plate tectonics was understood. And he even recognized the central role of biological processes in geologic phenomena, from rock weathering to the formation of limestones, something that would not be fully appreciated for almost two centuries with the emergence of the field of biogeochemistry. Less clear, however, is whether these ideas were preconceived notions or the result of careful study of rocks or some messy combination. In his book, Times Arrow, Times Cycle, the late paleontologist and writer Stephen Jay Gould argued that Hutton already had the idea of an unimaginably ancient self-repairing earth when he saw the famous outcrop at Sicker Point that is the celebrated birthplace of deep time. Hutton was part of the landed gentry and as a gentleman farmer, keenly aware of soil loss from his property each year. 
Like many Enlightenment thinkers, he was a deist and was troubled by the idea that God would allow the earth to be steadily worn down by erosion, making it eventually uninhabitable by humans. So long before he saw the famous outcrop at Sicker Point, he was actively looking for evidence of rejuvenation. Some of Playfair's accounts of outings with Hutton do seem to support Gould's charge that Hutton drew conclusions first, then looked for corroboration. Playfair describes a, a trip to Glen Tilt in the rugged Cairn Gorm Mountains of Scotland, where Hutton found evidence for his concept of subterranean igneous intrusions. Namely, he recognized fingers of granitic material that had made inroads into sedimentary rocks in a manner that could not be explained unless the material had been molten at the time. And again, this was really radical because there was a very eminent German geologist, Abraham Werner, who um, was probably the preeminent geologic thinker and certainly mineralogist of his day who proclaimed that granite and well, there was no such thing as molten rock. So Playfair describes Hutton's discovering this, this outcrop in the riverbed in this way. In the bed of the river, many veins of red granite were seeing, seen traversing the black micaceous schistus the sight of objects which verified at once so many important conclusions in his system filled Dr. Hutton with delight. And his feelings on such occasions were always strongly expressed. The guides who accompanied him were convinced that it must be nothing less than the discovery of a vein of silver or gold that could call forth such strong marks of joy and exultation. We get a glimpse here of Hutton as a single-minded zealot. But the paradox remains that Hutton, in fact, got very close to the truth in a way that many geologic ideologues before and after him did not. Also, I can attest, and I'm sure many here can also from personal experience, that most geologists have whooped in exactly the same way upon discovering rocks that confirmed a partly formed idea. For me, this anecdote, more than any other, brings Hutton fully to life. I recognize his pure joy in having sensed the logic of the earth. That episode at Glen Tilt occurred in 1785, three years before he visited the famous outcrop at Sicker Point, where he grew giddy from glimpsing the abyss of time. So it's pretty clear that he'd already developed the idea of a self-renewing Earth powered by a great internal heat engine before he ever saw the unconformity there. And I don't hold it against him. He sniffed it out and conjured it in his imagination, even before seeing unambiguous proof. He had already envisioned deep time. So Hutton gave us both deep time and a prescient glimpse of how the solid earth works. And for that, he deserves his place in the pantheon of geologists. But preoccupied as he was with the beautiful idea of an endlessly cycling earth, he was not especially interested in creating a chronology of events that had shaped the world or with calibrating the geologic time scale. Also, it's interesting to realize that Hutton's abstract cyclical version or vision of earth time was not theologically threatening. It could still coexist with the realm of divine wisdom. And for a time, the idea of ancient worlds embodied in that famous lithograph of Hutton's unconformity captured the public imagination in the way that space does today. The public appetite for geology was heightened even further by Charles Lyell's Principles of Geology, published in three volumes in the 1830s and which reigned as the authoritative textbook for many subsequent generations of geologists. Lyle, a lawyer by training, an accomplished orator who made long speaking tours across the United States and Europe, wrote about the emergent, emerging field with style and vivid imagery. One of my favorite quotes from Lyle is this passage, which I think any geologist will find resonant Although we are mere sojourners on the surface of the planet, chained to a mere point in space, enduring but for a moment of time, the human mind is not only enabled to number worlds beyond the unassisted ken of mortal eye, but to trace the events of indefinite ages before the creation of our race, and is not even withheld from penetrating into the dark secrets of the ocean or the solid globe, free like the spirit which the poet describes as animating the universe. This captures beautifully the second sight, the imaginative powers that are such an important part of the practice of geology. Hutton may, or sorry, Lyle may have been aware of the dangerous psychological and theological implications of the new science of geology. 
Even as he made the case for an incomprehensibly ancient earth, the vanished worlds whose secrets he vividly reveals, he keeps disjunct from the modern realm of humans. In an interesting analysis of Lyle's influence on Victorian culture, the literary scholar Michael Tomko has argued that Lyle intentionally downplayed the potential psychic threat posed by the new geologic worldview by introducing a strict impassable division between the natural and the spiritual. Lyle's tactical maneuver of keeping the human mind and soul at a safe remove from physical phenomena was temporarily successful and allowed geology to enjoy two decades of unconditional public love because the first editions of principles of geology did not mention biological evolution nor especially human origins. In fact, at the time that the first edition was published, many geologists had not yet accepted the idea that fossils represented extinct species as opposed to the remains of dead individuals of still existing lineages. And Lyle himself apparently did not believe that life forms had evolved over all the eons about which he waxed so elo eloquent. But Principles was an immensely important influence on Charles Darwin. The first volume was in fact among the small cache of books that Darwin brought with him on the Beagle. And eventually Darwin changed Lyle's mind about evolution. More about that in a minute. Evidence for the surprisingly wide reach of Lyle's principles, well beyond the circles of Victorian gentlemen scientists, comes from a lovely excerpt from Mark Twain's autobiography, in which he describes a grizzled old riverboat captain he once worked for. So bear with me, I love this two paragraph um, excerpt from Twain. Being a chief mate, he was a prodigious and competent swearer, a thing which the office, office requires but he had an auxiliary vocabulary which no other mate on the river possessed, and it made him able to persuade indolent roustabouts more effectively than did the swearing of any other mate in the business, because while it was not profane, it was of so mysterious and formidable and terrifying a nature that it sounded five or six times as profane as any language to be found on the forecastle anywhere in the river service. He had no education beyond reading and something which so nearly resembled writing that it was reasonably well calculated to deceive. He read and he read a great deal and diligently, but his whole library consisted of a single book. It was Lyle's Geology and he stuck to it until all its grim and rugged scientific terminology was familiar to his mouth, though he hadn't the least idea what the words meant. All he wanted out of those great words was the energy they stirred in his roustabouts. In times of extreme emergency, he would let fly a volcanic eruption of the old regular orthodox profanity mixed up and seasoned all through with imposing geological terms, then formally charge his roustabouts with being old Silurian invertebrate anisodactylus post Pleistocenes and damn the whole gang in a body to perdition. <laughs> so we have good evidence from Twain that Lyle's book was on at least two different boats at the same time, a steamer on the Mississippi and the Beagle off the coast of South America. And I mention this mainly just to underscore how widely read Lyle was and how popular the geosciences were and how they had captured the public imagination in this time. As I mentioned, Lyle's principles was a tremendously important influence on shaping Darwin's thinking. The three volumes are essentially one long argument for the power of slow incremental processes to accrue into great changes over time, exactly what Darwin imagined for evolution by natural selection. And it was the application of this powerful geological idea to the biological realm that caused geology to come into conflict with religious doctrine. Darwin's dangerous idea that all life forms, including humans, had evolved from a common ancestor was of course threatening to church teachings. And from the moment Origin of Species was published, the question of quantifying Hutton's and Lyell's deep time became freighted with theological importance. The physicist, Lord Kelvin, father of thermodynamics, the Einstein or Stephen Hawking of his day also weighed in on the subject. He rightly dismissed Hutton's idea of an infinitely old Earth as a violation of the laws of thermodynamics, essentially a perpetual motion machine. But then he went further and brought an end to geology's early golden days. Over the course of several decades, Kelvin issued a series of papers estimating the age of Earth, mainly based on calculations about how long it had taken the Earth to cool from a molten state. Um, and 
Also, some separate calculations about how long the sun could have been burning long before physicists actually understood what made the sun radiant, namely nuclear fusion. Kelvin's estimates based on the cooling of the earth started at around 400 million years in 1860 and grew pro progressively shorter, plateauing at around 20 million years, about 10 years later. Kelvin's primary argument was that the earth is still hot. There is high heat flow emanating from its crust and therefore it must be young. We now realize that his determinations were based on faulty assumptions, namely that the earth cools mainly by convection, not conduction, and that it has a source of new heat, radioactive elements, which are especially abundant in the continental crust from which most of his data came. But Kelvin's formidable mathematical prowess was intimidating to geologists of the time who could only splutter that 20 million years simply was not enough time for all the events they were documenting in the rock record to have unfolded. Darwin called Kelvin his sorest trouble and died with real doubts about whether his own ideas could be true on an earth that was only tens of millions of years old. It's actually amazing to me that Darwin and other 19th century geologists had any quantitative sense that the earth had to be hundreds of millions or billions of years old before there was any understanding of the basis of genetic variation or any way of quantitatively calibrating the rock record. I think that this is again a sign of their imaginative powers developed from close study of rocks and fossils, and in Darwin's case, also finches, beetles, pigeons, and worms. They had developed a kind of scientific second sight that does not conform to the scientific method, but often proves correct. Nobel Prize winning biologist Barbara McClintock, who discovered the molecular phenomenon of genetic recombination during meiosis, simply by studying kernels of maize for decades, called this a feeling for the organism, a leap of imagination, but imagination shaped and constrained by years of careful observation. And I think it's worth mentioning that modern historians of science have discovered correspondence, suggesting that Kelvin, meanwhile, a devout Christian, had religious motivations and was using his scientific reputation to cast doubt on Dar Darwin's ideas for non-scientific reasons. Kelvin's pronouncement that the age of the earth could not be greater than 20 million years ended geology's golden age and sent it into a decades long period during which several generations of geologists were forced, forced to suppress their own instincts and imagination. And again, I just wanna emphasize that my time scale on this graphic, which is not beautiful, but is logarithmic and so, Lord Kelvin really cramped the amount of time that geologists had to work with and his um, calculations prevailed for more than half a century, pretty much the, the last half of the 19th century and spilling a little bit into the 20th. Geology was also damaged in another way by Kelvin's decree. Geologists developed a distrust and distaste for physics and began to separate themselves from the other sciences. Young geologists weren't trained as rigorously as they should have been in physics and math, a legacy that unfortunately persists even today. As the 19th century went on, physics continued to triumph while geologists were either focused myopically on taxonomy rather than grand unifying theories or attached themselves to the grimy business of locating coal, coal and ores to fuel the roaring economy of the Gilded Age. So by the late 19th century, geology had acquired a tainted reputation as a lesser sort of science, while the success of physics caused its methods to become the template for all other sciences. I think there's another more stubborn reason that physics has attained and retains its position at the apex in the hierarchy of science. Physics and also chemistry are tellingly called pure sciences because they lay claim to universal eternal truths that are effectively outside time. By this reckoning, biology and especially geology, which are thoroughly steeped in time, are highly impure. These roots or these ideas, I believe, have deep roots in Western thinking traceable back to the Greeks and their concept of nested celestial spheres with the spheres of divine truth being furthest from the mundane and corrupt earthly realm. 3000 years later, we still privilege fields that focus on phenomena unburdened by time and messy histories. The ecologist John Hart of Berkeley has suggested a useful contrast between two worldviews in science. One is the Newtonian 
approach of physics. And I want to point out he uses Newtonian here not to contrast it with quantum physics and modern physics, but just the kind of underlying philosophy of physics he calls Newtonian. The Newtonian approach emphasizes the power of reductionism, idealizations, focuses on universal and eternal laws that can be quantified with equations. It's essentially timeless. And I would add often leads to hubris. We have the tendency to think that once we can describe things with quantitative equations, we're in control of them. Hart contrasts this Newtonian approach with what he calls Darwinian science, which focuses more on systems thinking. It respects idiosyncrasies and doesn't try to gloss them over with idealizations. It is all about evolutionary pathways, not universal statements about the way things are. In my nomenclature, it would be time full. And it tends to lead toward humility because we find that evolutionary paths are not often easily predictable. And I wanna emphasize that neither of these approaches is better. We need both to investigate a world that includes both the timeless and the time full. But the Newtonian approach has certainly dominated Western science for most of the last couple of centuries. I sometimes fantasize about an alternative timeline for the development of the geological and environmental sciences. How different our science and society might be if geologists hadn't been cramped by Lord Kelvin and hadn't been made to feel apologetic about being a time bound science. Without the heavy doubt about the age of the earth looming over the field, perhaps geology might have attracted more creative thinkers in the latter part of the 19th century. Perhaps some of them would have embraced the whole cloth approach to nature practiced by Alexander von Humboldt, who's here in the upper right, an early systems thinker who blithely rejected the reductionism of physics and embraced the natural world in its entirety rather than cutting it into tiny pieces. How wonderful it would have been if Humboldt and Darwin had been more nearly contemporaries. Humboldt was a full generation older than Darwin and in fact died just months before Origin of Species was first published. Darwin was as much a geologist as a biologist with his understanding of the power of incremental change over time and Humboldt's grasp of the geographic diversity of landscapes and ecosystems, there might have emerged a rich form of evolutionary natural science that saw earth and life as co-evolving systems. The biological and the geological sciences might have blossomed far earlier into a mature interdisciplinary field of inquiry. Of course, there would still have been religious resistance to the implications of Darwin's ideas for human origins, but I think the fixation on a certain kind of methodology, specifically one that discounts the importance of time and dismisses evolutionary histories as epiphenomena, was just as limiting for natural scientists, and the implications of this are more than merely academic. Most of the serious environmental problems we face today are the result of the failure in the 19th and early 20th centuries, well, even today, <laughs> to anticipate how new technologies, the internal combustion engine, chemical fertilizers, antibiotics, plastics, would interact over time with evolving natural systems. And because the public has long been taught to revere the certainty of physics as the measure of scientific credibility, the inability of geoscientists to speak about things like future climate change in anything but probabilistic terms makes it easy for skeptics to dismiss our work. And perhaps the most unfortunate outcome of geology's late coming of age is that at the time high school curricula were being coming established here in the US and around the world in the early 20th century, geology was not deemed to be an important or relevant area of study for young citizens. As a result, few people, voters, business people, politicians, journalists, have a clue about how the earth works in spite of the fact they are constantly casually making decisions that affect its long-term habitability. But let's get back to the historical narrative now. <laughs> Kelvin's stranglehold on geology finally began to loosen a few years before his death in 1907 with the discovery of radioactivity, which not only provided an explanation for his observation that the earth was still very hot, but also yielded a new approach to determining the age of geologic materials, including the earth itself. Among the pioneers in using natural radioactivity as a geologic clock was Arthur Holmes, one of the most remarkable and unfairly unsung geologic thinkers of the 20th century. 
Holmes was an 18 year old student at Imperial College in London when he undertook the project of determining the first absolute geologic ages for rocks. Starting in 1908, the year after Lord Kelvin died and just three years after Ernest Rutherford had quantified the process of radioactive decay as an exponential phenomenon, Holmes began seeking appropriate rock samples and separating minerals, especially zircon, that were known to contain, contain uranium, which is radioactive, but no lead, its ultimate daughter product at the time of crystallization. He then needed to find the relative concentrations of uranium and lead in the minerals and used Rutherford's radioactive decay law, which quantified radioactivity as a function of time to find how many years had elapsed since the mineral crystallized. At the time that he did this, amazingly, the idea of isotopes had not even been developed and he was measuring element ratios. By 1911, in spite of primitive lab facilities and the still rudimentary understanding of the phenomenon of radioactivity, Arthur Holmes had estimated absolute ages of a half dozen igneous rocks whose relative ages, based on the fossil-based um, geologic timescale, were bracketed by their relationships with sedimentary rocks. And I, I list these, these famous first rocks that he, he found these ages for. So they had been assigned places on the geologic time scale, but had their, their ages had been not known quantitatively until this time. Three samples were from the fossiliferous Paleozoic, and three were from the murky, then undifferentiated Precambrian. Even though some of the lead Holmes measured was not from the decay of the parent uranium, but from another radioactive element, thorium, his dates are amazingly close to modern values, at least within tens of millions of years. The very first rock analyzed, a granite from Norway, known to have been formed in the Devonian, yielded an age of approximately 370 million years, 18 times longer than Kelvin's estimate of the total age of the Earth. And a Precambrian metamorphic gneiss from Ceylon, now Sri Lanka, was found to be 1.64 billion years old, two full orders of magnitude greater than Kelvin's age of the Earth. Darwin's intuition was at last vindicated. Holmes would go on to become one of the preeminent geologists of the 21st century, or 20th century. Kelvin's long reigning proclamations became irrelevant. Parenthetically, years later, Holmes would challenge another of Kelvin's fundamental assumptions, arguing correctly that Earth cools mainly by convective rather than conductive heat loss, and even postulating an early version of plate tectonic theory. And that's what I've, I've shown here on the bottom. This is from um, a textbook that Holmes had that was kind of the successor to Lyle's Principles of Geology for many years. His Arthur Holmes um, textbook was the one everybody used in college classes. And he, um, in the 1930s, was postulating something like plate tectonics. Anyway, the geologic time scale could now be calibrated. Even the deepest reaches of geologic time could be fathomed. The Precambrian would no longer be a vast, uncharted, uncharted primordial wilderness. After Holmes's pioneering start, instrumentation and methods in geochronology steadily improved over the course of the 20th century with some interruption during the war years. Then in 1955, this man, Claire Patterson, another relatively unsung geologic hero um, from a small town in Iowa, deter determined the age of the earth and other objects in the solar system using lead isotope ratios from two types of meteorites. His work required an imaginative geochemical vision of Earth in time, picturing Earth and all the other objects in the solar system as part of one unified co-evolving geologic reservoir. And I don't really think we have time right now to go into the, the details of his um, calculations, but the age of the Earth comes from dating meteorites. And, and his great insight was that Earth and all its sister planets and all the objects in the solar system have co-evolved together. And so you date one of those things, you've dated the entire system. As a byproduct of his work, um, Patterson spent years trying to get replicable results and finally realized that the problem was ubiquitous lead particles in the ambient environment. En route to finding the age of the Earth, he invented the first positive pressure clean lab and spent the rest of his life campaigning to get lead out of gasoline, paint, and other products. Patterson's determination of 4.56 billion years for the age of the earth again put geology in conflict with the physicists of the day. Of the day. In 1955, estimates of the Hubble constant 
which is the relationship between the distance to faraway galaxy and the rate at which they're receding from us, suggested that the entire universe was only 1.8 billion years old. We have rocks older than that in Wisconsin. <laughs> Fortunately, the discord didn't last too long this time. The Hubble constant estimate steadily improved in the 1960s and by the 1970s, the universe was known to be at least 10 billion years old. And I think the preferred value is now 13.8 billion. While Claire Patterson's age determinations have stood the test of human time, there's admittedly something dissatisfying about how having the age of the earth come from extraterrestrial objects. And so for decades, geologists looked unsuccessfully for rocks from the first 500 million years of Earth's existence. This discovery in 2001 of sedimentary zircons in an ancient sandstone in the Jack Hills region of Western Australia with ages as great as 4.4 billion was therefore a much celebrated landmark in the history of geology. These few sub-millimeter sized grains bear the oldest surviving memory of early earth and point to both some granitic or continental crust as well as liquid water and perhaps oceans. But now let's step back and ask whether the calibration of the geologic timescale matters for ordinary earthlings. Certainly for those of us who already have rocks in their heads, <laughs> it does. But does it matter that ordinary people have any grasp of deep time? The extraordinary antiquity of the Jack Hill Zircons and of the earth itself are profoundly humbling, but I don't think that's really the whole or even the most important message that we should be trying to convey when we talk to students or the public about geologic time. Many people find contemplating geologic time alienating, and it doesn't help that geologic textbooks have for so long flogged people over the head with a 24 hour clock analogy that if the 4.56 billion year history of the earth were one 24 hour day, we modern humans would appear in just the last fraction of a second before midnight. It's literally true, but also fundamentally wrong in its emphasis. First, it suggests that we humans materialized out of nowhere, when in fact we have deep evolutionary roots that go back to the wee hours of the geologic morning. Second, it seems to absolve us for our environmental sins. What could we have done in that last fraction of a second that would make any difference to the earth? And finally, it's unintentionally apocalyptic. What happens at the stroke of midnight? Instead, I think we should emphasize that geology is not so much about time itself as the power of time to shape, erode, rebuild, innovate, exterminate, and transmogrify. And we should emphasize that we too live in geologic time on a continuum from the deep past on a path that leads into an equally vast geologic future. And I think it's useful to adopt the Greek distinction between chronos, raw time, billions and billions of years, and kairos, which is time within a narrative. As one starts knowing Earth's story and the vast stretches of geologic time are filled with narratives, the geologic periods, it's no longer alienating. The characters become familiar, the themes resonant. For me, knowing how to read the narratives embedded within rocks and landscapes enhances rather than diminishes my experience of being an earthling. Earth has used its time for endless prodigious creativity, continuously inventing new minerals and rocks, soil, continents, mountain belts, hurricanes, blizzards, tsunamis, microbes, fungi, trilobites, dinosaurs, woolly mammoths, rainforests, coral reefs, humans. Its evolution was never inevitable and its destiny is not preordained. Indeed, I find the idea of a six or 7,000 year old earth with a short shallow history positively terrifying while the enveloping presence of so many ancestors with a rich anthology of stories to recount is to me deeply comforting. All earthlings should have some grasp of the intrinsic time scales of geologic processes and our place in geologic time. And that is what I mean by timefulness. Everyone should know, for example, that it takes a few tens of millions of years to build a mountain belt and about the same time to tear it down. A few million years for a bipedal ape to evolve the capacity to make stone tools. A few thousand years for an ice age to give way to conditions that allowed those clever apes to practice agriculture. And less than a century for them to nudge the planet toward a runaway greenhouse state. And to empty groundwater aquifers, remove mountaintops and alter ocean chemistry. And in understanding Earth's biography and the wonderful fruits of geologic time, we can perhaps embrace rather than fear the role of time in our own lives. 
Perception of the true nature of time is the one sense that grows more acute with age. Sight and hearing may fade, but in growing older, one gains respect for the power of incremental change and must come to terms with the fact that there is more than one version of the world. Accepting the reality that we are embedded in deep time is in my view less problematic than the suggestions of some philosophers who assert that time is a human construct, which seems incredibly self-important, or some physicists who consider time to be an unexplained problem or some sort of illusion. Both assertions deny the compelling internally consistent logic of the rock record, and such claims are profoundly dehumanizing since they deny the, they deny the fact of all of our experiences that time is all too real. For me, understanding our place in geologic time provides a middle way between narcissistic self-absorption and nihilistic despair. It reminds us that we too will eventually be ancestors, so we might as well do our best to be good ones. And that requires making peace with our timeful, temporary nature. I heard an interview a few months ago with the British Pakistani novelist Mohsin Hamid. And at one point he said something that is both profound and obvious. We are all migrants in time. So let us reimagine, re-envision ourselves as the latest in a long line of pilgrims in deep time, en route together toward a common geologic future in the four-dimensional space of timeland. Thank you very much. Here is a crass commercial ad <laughs> for my books and also my email address. Honestly, am I back talking? This is Michael. Can anybody hear me? I see a few hands. Okay. Oh, great. Thanks, Marshall. That was a fascinating lecture. And I've got almost no questions. So you must have bowed them, bowled them over. <laughs> Here comes a few now. So I did have a comment earlier on by someone named Imoba. I don't think that's the real name, but who knows? She says, or he says, Darwin also had Humboldt's book, Nature, on the Voyage of the Beagle. I recommend Andrew Wolf's excellent biography of Humboldt, The Invention of Nature. And Vince Matthews, who is in your country, says Wolf's book is one of the best I've ever read. You want to comment on this? I, I just agree. Yeah, I, it's on my nightstand. It's, it's excellent. <laughs> and actually reading Humboldt's book, Views of Nature, is amazing. There's a recent um, translation of it. I can't remember who the translator from the German. It's an astonishing work. I mean, it's thick and big, and it has as many footnotes, I think, as prose in the front. It, it's, it's just amazingly rich and packed with observations. But Andrea Wolf's biography is, is an easier way to enter into Humboldt's mind. So yes, thank you for that. that and Bill Tepper, who is a practicing professional geologist, says, it's amazing that the task of measuring the first uranium lead, lead, lead ages was given to an 18 year old. Do you know how that came to be? Well, it wasn't given to him. I think he was curious. He was a physics student at Imperial College and um, saw the potential for radioactivity to be used as a tool to date rock. So I, I, you know, I don't quite understand how he got funding or how he, I think he invited himself into somebody's lab. Um, another autobiography or biography I should mention is of um, Arthur Holmes is by Cherry Lewis, I think. And it has the unfortunate name, The Dating Game. <laughs> but it's um, that I recommend that for better answer to that question, how Holmes even picked up the project. But I, I think it was his own initiative. Well, that's, even, that's even more impressive. Yeah. Okay, so uh, Philip Finner says, I read The Discovery of Time by Stephen Toulmin and June Goldfield as a geology student in the early 70s, and it amazed me. I don't know if you have anything to say about yeah, that. Yeah, I don't know that. What, who is the author again? I should try to find that. I'm... Toulmin, T-O-U-L-M-I-N, and June Goldfield. Okay. Discovery of Time. Lots of kudos to you. <laughs> Wonderful lecture. Uh, do you have any, uh, Carol Hardy, 
says, do you have any comments on Jay Brownowski's book, Science and Human Values, came out in 1978? Well, yeah, I remember that. I was in high school at the time. <laughs> I don't know that I, and I may have read it. I'm sorry, I don't think I remember enough about it. Okay, so I'm, I'm caught up on the questions. If there's anything out there, let it be. Uh, we'll keep Marsha a few more minutes. It's five o'clock now. And uh, I wanna say that I really appreciate your uh, taking this time. I invited you before COVID about five years ago to give a talk like this. And I think the answer was, I'm not really partial to traveling all the way to Seattle or something along that line. So I'm glad uh, one upshot of COVID is we've extended our reach and have people like you from a distance, which are, make it very easy to have a speaker. Expenses are not involved, sorry. And, yeah, and carbon footprint is lower too. Carbon footprint's minimal. So, okay, let's see something here from uh, David Minger. What are the, I'm trying to keep up with it. What are the current thoughts on source of water on Earth? Where did it come from? Right, and that is, I'm an outsider to cosmochemistry, but the the, con, the the debate has always been how much of it is native and how much is imported by comets and maybe chondritic meteorites. My understanding is is that it's it's a bit of both, and I don't know the, the ratio, but there, there would have been some hydrous initial constituent of the earth. Um, some chondrites are fairly hydrous, but that um, I think the ratios of hydrogen isotopes, deuterium to ordinary hydrogen, are consistent with a fair percent coming from comets. And again, maybe other geologists out there are more up on the latest, but it's probably a hybrid of, of um, water that was part of the original stuff of the earth that's been exhaled by volcanism over time and, and some that was imported. Um, and some of it might have been imported as late as the late heavy bombardment that affected the moon and formed all the Maria on the moon. Okay, Mary Wegman, who I think might be the mother of Carl, but I'm not sure about that. She says, how can the general public be educated about this? What's your tactic or what's your approach here? Yeah, I mean, it's so frustrating to me, as I suggested in the talk, that most Earthlings have no idea <laughs> about the history of the planet, how it works, what the intrinsic characteristic timescales of different processes are. And it's it's a sad artifact of the, the relative time of maturation of, of the geosciences relative to the other sciences. Um, I mean, that's why I write for the public. I, I give a, quite a few lectures and elder hostel type seminars and things. And I think there's a huge appetite that many people have, especially later in life, to really understand where they are, their local landscapes have a sense of, of place. And we just don't have that as an integral part of our educational system. Um, I'm working in the preliminary stages with a group who is trying to suggest an AP course in geoscience um, in high schools, which I think is a good strategy because it would make something that's, it's got the cachet of AP, not just um, high school courses, which sadly too often are for non-college bound kids. If there is geoscience in some of our high schools, it's often not considered as important for kids who are aspiring to get into elite colleges and universities as say physics, chemistry, and biology. But if we had an AP course in the geosciences, then it would have that sort of aspirational characteristic. So it may be a long haul. It's really hard to change high school curricula. There's a huge inertia <laughs> there, but that would be a start. Yeah. Um, From yeah. John Karachewski, he's uh, in California, I think. Your students have diverse backgrounds and experiences. How do you teach them to appreciate time? On my, for myself, I can best appreciate time when exploring and hiking in special places like national parks. Well, and I think that's exactly the approach I use, learning through your feet and really sensing. Um, here in Wisconsin, I know you may not perceive this to be a geological mecca, but we actually have a lot of geodiversity. <laughs> so we have great glacial, um, deposits, we have Paleozoic flat-lying rocks, and then we have a really complicated Proterozoic story as well. And we're fortunate right where I am in Northeastern Wisconsin to have all of that within just, you know, 45 minute drive. So I, I can sort of unpeel the layers for students even in a, an intro class. We, we see the evidence of each of these 
chapters and little by little they start understanding having a sense of what I call temporal proportion. <laughs> the ice age was just the other day. The Silurian rocks were laid down a while ago. And the Proterozoic rocks, was a that's a long time ago. So, so developing that kind of depth of field, I think is, is what many people find challenging. But again, if there are stories that you wrap around these things, what are these rocks telling us? What are their experiences? It's not just the numbers, 10 to the whatever, it's, it's who's round, what, what is the story of this place at a given time? But it, it takes time and I, and I think it's okay to have, to acknowledge that it's kind of a muscle that has to be developed, this habit of thinking across time scales. It's one of the, the cognitive skills that just, you have to develop it. It doesn't necessarily come instantly. So Jeff Tepper, who asked a question a little bit ago says, I appreciate your insights into the origins of geology being views as a, viewed as a lesser science. Do you see any indication that this is changing as boundaries between different sciences blur together? Possibly. Um, AP approach. I, yeah, I, I think that's a good insight. I, I hope that's true. I mean, I just always, it's always rankled me. To me, <laughs> understanding the earth is just intrinsically interesting and it's important. Sadly, I think sometimes geologists still apologize for the field and I, I say this in, in the intro in timefulness that one perverse way that we've had to get funding um, for especially investigating really ancient rocks is to, to wrap ourselves in astrobiology, <laughs> which is the search for life on other planets. And so people who are studying ancient earth say, well, this could be an analog to life on Mars rather than just having it be the study of the earth <laughs> as if that's not interesting enough in itself. And then a lot of departments, including my own, um, have changed their names from geology to either geosciences or folded into earth and environmental science. And maybe that's okay. Maybe that's a natural evolution of the field. And, and it may be that geology is, the, the word geology is so freighted with these old associations, we just need to get rid of it and free ourselves from the public stereotype. Um, so I think a lot of things that, that geologists consider geology, the, the, the general public wouldn't consider geology, climate change, soils, these things are all geological, but um, maybe the public doesn't realize that, that we claim them under the umbrella of geology. Okay, and maybe one final thing here is someone, Leslie, I think it's our host, says, happily the volcanoes keep blowing up and we get, we, we're helping get news into the classrooms from the physical dangers of volcanoes, so. Yeah, that's true. The earth, when it speaks, that gets people's attention. <laughs> so I, I think we'll stop the questions there. I'll send you the chat uh, questions if I can clip them out of here so you can see what the reactions were and help you uh, appreciate our audience. So I wanna thank you uh, and maybe people can virtually clap on their little windows there and tell you how much we really appreciated your time and your expertise, so. Uh, welcome back when you when you get your next book done. <laughs> Which is what is your next book? Um, yeah, I was I think it's a jinx to say too much, but it's it's something approaching a memoir. So we'll see. <laughs> but I have this little day job as a professor, so we'll see when it gets done. It's on the way. Okay, well, thank you very much. I think we'll wrap it up here. Thanks for coming, everybody. Thank you. Mm-hmm.